Good afternoon and um, welcome to the June uh, Living with Disability Research Centre seminar. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which La Trobe University campuses are situated. We recognise their ongoing connection to the land and the value of their unique contribution to the university and wider Australian society. La Trobe is committed to providing opportunities for Indigenous Australians, both as individuals and communities through teaching and learning, research and community partnerships and across all of our campuses. La Trobe University pays our respects to Indigenous elders past, present and emerging and will continue to incorporate Indigenous knowledge, systems and protocols as part of our ongoing strategic and operational business. So welcome to the seminar. Um, if you haven't been to one of these seminars before, uh, they generally take the format that we'll have two speakers this afternoon. The first speaker will speak for about half an hour and then we'll have questions and then a very quick break and then we'll have the second speaker. If you want to ask a question or make a comment, then please put it in the Q&A box and we'll be able to ask that question for you. It's too clunky to give you uh, the right to speak, I'm afraid. So this afternoon is a really interesting uh, set of papers which come from an ARC discovery grant that uh, Elan Wiesel from the University of Melbourne has been leading over the last three or four years. <laughs> it's gone on for a long time because, because of the COVID interruptions. Um, and uh, he's going to present, uh, and, and the, the, the project has looked at, at the um, diversity in the city and how people with intellectual disabilities are included across cities and mainstream and specialist services. So he's going to present one of the papers that's just very recently been published from that uh, study. And then uh, Dr. Alain Van Holsten, who was the research fellow on that project, will present one of the other papers that's just been published too from the study. So they're both geographers um, and they bring that sort of lens with them. And unfortunately, I've been part of the team too. So I bring sort of practice lens. So it's a bit of a, it's a very much a, a multidisciplinary perspective, uh, but with some very strong insights with a geographic sort of mind. So I'm going to hand over to uh, Ilan Wiesel, who's an associate professor at the School of Geography, Earth and Atmospheric Sciences, as it's now called, at the University of Melbourne. And he's going to present his paper, Mainstreaming Differentiation and Individualization as Modes of Inclusion in Mainstream Services. So over to you, Alain. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chris. And hi, everyone. Uh, I would also like to acknowledge I'm in my office at the University of Melbourne. Uh, so we are on uh, unceded uh, Wurundjeri land. So I'd like to also acknowledge and pay respect to elders past, present, present and emerging. Um, so I will talk about that paper that uh, Chris has mentioned and is looking at uh, mainstream differentiation and individualization. So really what we were interested in when we've written this paper that was published just recently in Disability and Society, uh, I guess two primary questions. One is at a very basic level, what adjustments are being made to include users uh, with an intellectual disability in mainstream services? And we took a very broad definition here of mainstream services. We looked at housing, health, community services, um, and transport. And we wanted to see whether these services are actually adjusting uh, to include more participants or users, service users who have an intellectual disability. And if so, what these adjustments are. But I guess going beyond just listing very specific types of adjustments in a sort of mechanical way, we're trying to understand how, and this is specifically in this paper, we were trying to understand how these adjustments interact with uh, what we argue are three quite broad paradigms that have been driving disability policy, and I would say even social policy more broadly uh, in recent decades. Those are paradigms of mainstreaming, differentiation, and individualization. So what I'll do in, in this presentation today is, is outline uh, these, these three paradigms. And then I'll outline our, using our empirical data from our study, 
Uh, I'll outline three, what we argue are three modes of inclusion that happen at the service level in the mainstream service level and how they interact with those three broader paradigms of social uh, policy and disability policy. So I'll start with a very, I guess, a rough broad definition for um, each of those three paradigms. And then I'll explain a bit in a bit more detail each of those. The first paradigm is that of differentiation. It's, it's a paradigm of separating services, providing separate service to specific distinct uh, minority groups. It could be people with intellectual disability, it could be people with disability, it could be uh, particular cultural groups. Uh, the second paradigm is, is mainstreaming, which involves, uh, I guess, an aspiration to integrate those minority groups and all of them in, in universal services that uh, cater for all people. And then the, the third paradigm is individualization, and that's about tailoring services to individuals rather than to group preferences and needs. Um, so let me go with a little bit more detail about each of those paradigms. Um, and that's kind of, again, uh, looking at the literature. And some of that literature is related to social policy more generally, and some of it specifically about disability. I'll outline some of the drivers for, me, for each of those paradigms and some of the um, mechanisms or ways that it's been applied in practice, and then the critiques uh, that uh, and tensions surrounding each of those paradigms. So I'll start with differentiation. What's, so again, differentiation is about the provision of different services to different minority groups. And in disability services, we, we, there's a very long history of that, uh, starting from, uh, I guess, the 18th century, 17th century, and institutions and separate specialist services, uh, special schools. But uh, I guess even in the 1990s, there's uh, been other drivers of differentiation in social policy more broadly, not just in relation to disability. And part of that was the, the multiculturalism agenda. And uh, that's in relation particularly to cultural groups and the idea that recognition that different groups in society, different minority groups have different needs, have different, I guess, uh, cultural uh, preferences, and that these cannot always be met uh, by existing mainstream services. And therefore, uh, we need to uh, provide distinct specialist services. So the ideas of multiculturalism and recognition, recognition uh, of difference and identities uh, have been drivers of that agenda. And the way it's been applied, I guess, specifically in disability services is, again, in those providing those specialist services. That's the language that's now being used in the NDIS specialist. Uh, I think before that, it was just special, special schools. Uh, and that's through services, through housing, et cetera. And there's been a, a very strong pushback against uh, that agenda, the differentiation. Uh, that it leads to a more fragmented society that's in respect to multiculturalism. Crit crit uh, I guess uh, critics of multiculturalism argue that it fragments our society. Um, that in, in catering for, for defined groups, uh, we assumed very fixed identities and we fail to acknowledge diversity even within those groups. Uh, so if you, you take, for example, people with disability and you provide special services for people with disability, uh, that doesn't necessarily recognize how diverse people with disability themselves are. Uh, so missing out on, on, on what now some, some writers refer to as super diversity. And ultimately, the, crit the critics would argue that it doesn't lead to inclusion, but to the exclusion of marginalized people from the mainstream and from society. So I guess uh, in response to some of those critiques of differentiation, uh, there's a paradigm of, of mainstreaming, uh, which is driven by, I guess, understanding all those problems with differentiation. Part of it in the, in the 1990s, early 2000s, uh, was a pushback against uh, multiculturalism. Uh, that was uh, anti-immigration sentiments. Um, but that was also in the context of a global financial crisis, austerity, and, and there are, it was a view that mainstreaming can be a lot more efficient in uh, providing services to diverse minority groups. 
uh, I guess, through universal, universal services for everyone rather than separate services for each group. Uh, specifically for people with disability, people with intellectual disability, we see the kind of mechanisms uh, that are being used to, to drive mainstreaming. Uh, deinstitutionalization is an obvious one. Um, in, in the NDIS, we see uh, the ILC, which is about building capacity in mainstream services. It's a very small part of the NDIS, uh, but it kind of meets that idea of mainstreaming. And the, the legislation around the NDIS uh, very clearly identifies mainstreaming as one of the objectives of, of the, whole, uh, the whole scheme. And mainstreaming too has its critics. Uh, in part, it's, it's again coming back to this sort of um, uh, differentiation idea, saying that, well, mainstreaming doesn't, doesn't really recognize those distinct needs of each minority group. Uh, so you generate services that don't really meet uh, the needs of different people. And I think especially in disability studies, there's been a very strong critique of mainstreaming coming from, a, I guess, a, a position or a framework of belonging, the idea that individuals who come and try to become part of the mainstream experience uh, significant difficulties. They don't experience a sense of belonging uh, in those settings. Uh, and I guess, why is it that inclusion and belonging in a mainstream setting is being uh, valued as more important and more real form of belonging and inclusion than their belonging in communities that consist of other people with disabilities uh, where they might feel a much greater sense of belonging. So a paradigm of belonging was a very, uh, I think, a very powerful critique of, of mainstreaming as, as a paradigm. And then the third kind of broad paradigm, I think, that's been really driving a lot of the thinking around social policy in, in, in recent decades is individualization. Uh, and I think it's been driven by two uh, quite different, uh, I guess, agendas. One is a more rights, human rights driven, self-determination agenda that really recognize, recognizes individual rights. And um, I guess the, the idea of self-determination, the idea of individuals really taking control of their own lives, being the, the main actors and agents driving uh, their own lives. And then the other, the other big driver of this individualization agenda is a neoliberal ideology that, I guess, uh, valorizes consumer choice, uh, valorizes an understanding of individuals as consumers and the market as a, a very effective way to, um, uh, to, I guess, empower individuals as consumers. So those two, two drivers have somehow collided and uh, combined into an individualization agenda. And what we've seen in disability policy specifically and how it's being applied is particularly through individualized funding. The NDIS is probably one of the uh, most um, significant uh, case studies of this kind of very broad brush wide application, application of individualized funding. Uh, but it, and other layers in, involve, I guess, uh, person-centered planning and support is another way of uh, driving individualization that's, I guess, more aligned with self-determination uh, ideologies. So there is a lot of critique coming out in, in recent years uh, around individualization, particularly for that focus on individuals failing to engage with the wider structural social inequalities um, that uh, neoliberal uh, market-driven way that it's been applied are uh, really reinforcing this advantage rather than solving it. And a lot of research showing that uh, individualized funding in particular uh, is quite beneficial for, for some individuals, particularly those who have quite strong informal support around them, uh, but can be uh, disadvantages to others who don't have those supports. So, that those are the three broad paradigms uh, that um, we're engaging with in this paper. Um, it's kind of coming from the literature and I haven't included the references here in the um, uh, PowerPoint slides, but you're very welcome to have a look at the paper where we outline quite a, I guess, a comprehensive review of literatures around those paradigms. <laughs> 
But I want to move now to talk about our own empirical research. And I'll talk about three modes of inclusion or types of adjustments that are made at the service level. And we'll map how these uh, modes of inclusion, I guess, uh, align with those pre three paradigms of mainstreaming, differentiation, and individualization. So first, I'll, I'll just uh, briefly describe the methods we've used in the study. Uh, so we had two references groups who were really guiding us as, a, as the CIs on the project. Um, one was comprised of senior staff in, in policy and industry bodies. And the other reference group comprised of self-advocates for self-advocates with intellectual disabilities. Uh, so we really attempted to achieve co-design and um, involve the self-advocates in, in, in really shaping the, the research agenda, our methods, and how we do the research, and also how we interpret, interpret uh, the findings. Uh, between 20, 2017 and 2020, we've done interviews across four sites, case studies, uh, Western Sydney, Newcastle, Northeast Melbourne, and Geelong. Uh, there are reasons why we chose those particular areas, specifically, uh, I guess, New South Wales and Victoria. There's a quite nice, um, I guess, um, comparison across those two, those four sites. And the other reason was the NDIS being rolled out in these uh, four sites in different parts. And we wanted to see how that might impact the, um, the results. And across those four sites, we've done interviews. That was Ellen, who will speak to you after me. And she's conducted most of these interviews with uh, people with intellectual disabilities, 40 interviews, and 49 interviews with service staff uh, in, in mainstream facilities. Uh, and, and some of the way that we've identified services was actually starting from an interview with a person with disability, asking them which services, which mainstream services they use in their daily lives, and then going to those mainstream services and, and talking to those services and asking what adjustments they were doing uh, to facilitate inclusion. But we've also found services uh, in other ways, just by getting advice from a reference group, for example, uh, telling us uh, suggesting suggesting services that we should speak to because um, they're doing uh, interesting work around inclusion, for example. So I'll present some of the key findings in terms of how the three modes of inclusion that we've identified at the service level. Uh, these are the three modes, uh, diversity and inclusion efforts, specific adjustments for people with intellectual disability and personal support. So those are the three broad ways that we argue um, mainstream services adjust to include people with intellectual disability if they do. I'll start with the first one, diversity and inclusion efforts. Uh, by that, I mean a broad commitment of those services to be inclusive of a diverse population of service users particularly those from marginalized social groups. So this is not about people with intellectual disabilities specifically. This is about being service that um, provides service to a wide range of people that acknowledges diversity, that wants to include diversity. Um, we found that that was quite dominant in services that were run by or contracted by local governments. Um, and that the way that they've tried to implement that general diversity and inclusion efforts was through having people uh, appointed as diversity and inclusion officers or outreach officers. They had different names and different services. Diversity and inclusion plans, they had all sorts of plans in place to uh, improve the, I guess, the inclusivity of their service. Um, when they ran activities, uh, they were quite flexible sometimes in trying to adjust what they're doing to uh, address different users with different needs, uh, whether those are cultural appropriate need, whether in terms of cultural appropriate appropriateness or in terms of uh, disability inclusivity. inclusivity. An interesting uh, adjustment that we found in many services was that they were trying to generate what they described as a warm and welcoming atmosphere. They really uh, put effort and emphasize that idea that if they generate a, a welcoming atmosphere, uh, people from marginalized groups will feel more comfortable and less uh, excluded. Uh, 
uh, and they saw that as a very important way of uh, implementing that ethos and it would be effective for very many different people from many different groups. Uh, they would often apply where they thought that this, the activities needed to be adjusted, they would apply smaller ratios, so more staff per service users in, in their activities. Or another way that they really been thinking about it was trying to re facilitate regular use uh, or ongoing membership of, of the service. So they wanted service users who come regularly. So if it was, uh, for example, a leisure center or a library, they, they made all sorts of things like providing discounts for people so that they could come regularly. Uh, and they believe that that would allow them to get to know those people better and then to be able to address their uh, specific needs better. So those are some of the broad adjustments that some of uh, the services we spoke to uh, did to include a very wide range of uh, groups. Uh, and then we wanted to see whether that sort of diversity and inclusion efforts actually helps and include people with intellectual disability more specifically. Um, when we asked them, when we asked the services, uh, they were not quite sure. They were they had some difficulty actually identifying who in their service, who among their services had intellectual disabilities. Uh, some of them struggled to give us responses. Uh, examples that related to people with uh, intellectual disability. Most of their examples would have been for people from non-English speaking backgrounds, children, people with physical or sensory disabilities. Uh, they typically conflated intellectual disability with autism. Uh, so they would speak enthusiastically about you know, adjustments to reduce sensory overload, for example, uh, but um, but not, uh, not really able to identify specific ad adjustments for people with intellectual disability, which I guess raises the concern that within this broad diversity and inclusion efforts, uh, people with intellectual disability are at risk of uh, being marginalized or forgotten or confused with, with other people. And I'll just bring here one example uh, where Indeed, I think many of those adjustments do have very positive impacts for service users with intellectual disability. Obviously, you know, having a warm, welcoming environment and having discounts, those sorts of things are very helpful. Uh, but we've also identified some negative consequences where services were not particularly um, aware of how their adjustments were impacting service users with intellectual disability specifically. So in this example, we have Danielle who uh, was going to the library on a, on a regular basis. Um, and the li library has invested uh, in this kind of uh, generating a more diverse inclusion efforts. Uh, and they focused on, on children in particular. Uh, uh, but Danielle does go to the, um, to the library and she enjoys it, uh, but she spends most of her time there in, in the children uh, section. So, so they have made adjustments. It does make it possible for her to, to participate and engage, uh, but really only in the children's section. So that, that can be very problematic. I'll move on to talk about adjustments, another layer of adjustments, what I will argue is a second mode of inclusion, that is adjustments that were made by those services, mainstream services to really specifically targeting people with intellectual disability and to enable their participation. So those are adjustments to program design, to management and delivery, really focusing on service users with intellectual disability. Uh, often that wasn't driven necessarily by a uh, big ideology or some pre-planning, but actually encountering service users with intellectual disability, realizing that what they've got doesn't quite work and that they need to fix some of those things. So it was very driven by the actual everyday encounter with service users. Um, very often it would have focused on communication and behavior management. The sorts of adjustments that the services would take would be developing all kinds of communication aids, uh, access aids, all kinds of resources, especially around communication. Um, many of them would use resources they would find uh, on the internet or sort of publicly available uh, resources. Uh, not all of them would have necessarily been 
uh, ideal or specifically uh, adjusted for people with intellectual disability, uh, but they, ha they have been using those. Uh, also to use uh, staff training. And again, they would often turn to online training where they could find uh, free or other types of uh, online training that would encourage or require their staff to take training in terms of uh, improving their communication uh, capacity. Um, one of the issues with the staff training uh, was that there's a very high turn, uh, turnover of staff in those mainstream services, like in a, in a library or in a, um, I guess in a leisure center in particular, uh, a lot of casual staff. So training uh, staff is not very effective in, in when people just move on very fast. Uh, some of the services talked about that first induction of a person service user coming in and, and putting in the expectations around behavior uh, was the, one of the ways that they would deal with uh, behavior challenges. But what was the most significant and, and probably the most uh, contentious finding was that many services would turn to separate activities for people with intellectual disabilities. So when they realized they have uh, a number of people with intellectual disabilities coming in, uh, they would organize separate activities for them within a mainstream setting. Uh, so in a health service, it could be even involving the, uh, the nurses and doctors going to do home visits uh, in group homes or in a leisure center would involve a separate group for people with a disability or people with intellectual disability, say in a swimming class. And we, 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 we spend a lot of our time, I think, and Ellen did uh, spend quite a lot of time in the interviews trying to get uh, to understand uh, how these services think about separating activities and how that's experienced by people with intellectual disability using those mainstream services. So we, we've got a, an example here, uh, an interview with Lisa, and, um, and Lisa is saying that uh, she doesn't mind uh, being with other people with disabilities. She's, she's happy with that. So I think that sort of uh, reflects some of the participants who were quite comfortable uh, with necessar not necessarily being part of a, a large mainstream, uh, I guess, group, but having uh, a group of other people with disability within the mainstream service. Uh, and I think that mirrors quite well some of the literature on belonging that suggests that people with intellectual disability often do feel more comfortable in the presence of other people uh, with uh, similar disabilities. And the service staff that we've uh, talked to, they were, uh, I think there were mixed, mixed, mixed responses. Some of them sort of had an ideology that they should open up those uh, activities for everyone and that they shouldn't separate activities. Others just acknowledged that uh, it works. And in this case, for example, this interview in a community center in Melbourne, um, someone said that ideologically, they didn't think that they should separate activities, but they noticed that those participants were having a lovely time. Uh, so they just keep it going. Uh, so there was sort of uh, ambivalent about the question of whether they should separate activities or whether they should uh, keep activities for everyone or involve, engage people with intellectual disabilities and activities for everyone. The third mode I want to speak about is that of personal support. So even when services do uh, have a diversity and inclusion efforts that they want to include everybody, and even when they do very targeted adjustments for people with intellectual disability, uh, many people would always still require some form of personal support, whether it's formal support workers or informal carers to assist them when they access and use mainstream services. Um, what we've found around those sort of, I guess the role of personal support within mainstream settings is that a couple of issues. One is that people with intellectual disabilities, our participants had very different levels of, in terms of access to personal support. Some of them had enough NDIS funding to bring a, a paid supporter with them, others didn't. Some of them would have uh, informal carers, others didn't. Uh, so that already generates, uh, I guess, uh, inequity uh, in terms of uh, the quality and access to personal support. Another issue is the lack of clarity about the roles and responsibilities. When a, pers when a person comes 
with a, a, a carer, for example, or a paid support worker. And there's also staff in the mainstream services whose responsibility is to, uh, I guess, to provide the support to that service users. There was a lot of lack of clarity around that. We've interviewed some mainstream services. They thought all the responsibility should be that personal supporter, the carer or the support worker. Uh, in other times, we've seen the opposite. The support workers are bringing a person, uh, but then disappearing and not at all being involved in providing support. Um, so that was quite problematic. And I don't think there is any uh, real policy clarity about uh, what needs to happen in, in those uh, circumstances. But we've also found in our, in our research a few examples of good collaboration, whether it was structured through some kind of uh, partnership between a mainstream service and a disability service provider, or sometimes it was very, um, I guess, spontaneous, uh, just on the spot, just uh, a carer and a mainstream service staff working together quite effectively to support a person with intellectual disability to participate in an activity, whether it's, uh, I guess, uh, at the gym, or, or doing something at the library. Here's some quotes. Um, these are some of the, I think, mainstream services complaining that the carers are not doing their work. Um, and we have other quotes of carers complaining about the mainstream services staff not doing their work. I think this is an example um, of a probably a more effective collaboration between uh, mainstream services and specialist or personal supporters. In fact, it involves, a, I guess, um, a neighborhood house, a community center. Uh, and they, I don't know whether to define them as uh, mainstream services or specialists, they somewhere they occupy a sort of space in between. And Ellen might be talking about that a bit more in more detail. Uh, but they're quite interesting because they really work closely uh, both with the supporters of people with disability and with the mainstream service providers and trying to really work together, plan to support uh, people with intellectual disability. Uh, for example, here they were talking about um, even introducing people, walking them across from, from one place to another so that they meet the staff and doing the introduction and helping them feel, I guess, more comfortable and a sense of belonging. So we found that around neighborhood houses, they played an interesting role in, in facilitating uh, that relationship between personal supporters and mainstream service staff. So where this is all leading to, I think, I've identified those three modes of inclusion that happen at the service level, diversity and inclusion efforts, specific adjustments for people with intellectual disability and personal support for a person with intellectual disability. And then we map that against this kind of broad paradigms, not necessarily of inclusion, paradigms of social policy and disability policy, uh, mainstreaming, differentiation and individualization. And on a first glance, you, you can see that there's almost a kind of a, a clear al alignment between, uh, I guess, specific modes and specific paradigms. So diversity and inclusion seems to, to work quite well with mainstreaming. They, this kind of similar ideology underpinning both of those. Uh, specific adjustments for people with intellectual disability kind of aligned with a, an ideology or a paradigm of differentiation. And personal support for people with intellectual disability also aligns with individualization, not least because uh, to bring with you a paid supporters, you need to have today, you need to have individualized funding. So there's some level of alignment, but it's, it's not one to one. And I think specifically around things like the separation of activities for people with intellectual in, in the mainstream. Uh, it's a form of differentiation within mainstream. Those things become a bit more uh, muddled up in all sorts of ways. What we are arguing maybe, I think in this, uh, in this paper is that in some of the literature, you would see mainstreaming presented as the, really the antonym of differentiation uh, and individualization is, is a sort of separate thing. Uh, but what we try to argue here is that when you look at it at, in an operational level at the service level, and maybe also at a much broader level, kind of theoretical, 
uh, we should see these as three layers of inclusion. So all these things need to work together. Uh, they're not antonyms, but they're complementary. Um, you can see it as one layer of having a diversity of inclu and inclusion efforts to include everyone, but that would never be enough to include very specific people like people with intellectual disability. So you also need to work through very specific adjustments for that particular group, and that's another layer. But then there's a third layer on top of that, that there is a need for personal support, and we need to, to really clarify how that could work when you've got uh, people coming with their supports and you got those mainstream services and who's responsible for what. But working through those three layers or three modes of inclusion and seeing them as complementary, we think might be the way forward uh, to facilitate inclusion in mainstream services. Um, I think I'd leave it here and open it up for questions. Thanks everyone. <laughs> and thanks for listening. And here's a, a reference if you also want to uh, have a look at the full paper. Thank you, Elaine. I think that was fantastic. And the way you brought it together at the end makes so much sense. Uh, right, welcome to the second half of the seminar. And you will have heard from Elaine that um, Ellen Van Holsten was uh, part of the IRC project that he was talking about. Um, and she's now a vice chancellor's postdoctoral fellow at. RMIT, so she's a postdoc for the next three years and has been producing some amazing um, cultural geography work. Um, but she's going to talk today about some of the findings uh, from this study and her paper is entitled People with Intellectual Disability and the Digitalization of Services. So welcome, Helen, uh, Ellen, over to you. Thank you, Chris. Um, yes, so I will be presenting work from the same ARC Discovery Project. Um, so, like Elan said, the main focus of the project was to study the accessibility of mainstream health, housing, community, and then later we also added transport services uh, for people with intellectual disability in Australian cities. And the project, um, in, in my view, and for this paper, really focused on two dynamic circumstances. The first is the reconfiguration of support that is available to um, people with intellectual disability under the rollout of the National Disability Insurance Scheme. And then the second is the privatization that shapes service delivery in contemporary cities. And so in today's paper, um, which is co-authored with the entire team, I'm going to present our analysis of how digital infrastructure makes services easier to use for some people with intellectual disability and harder for others. And we draw attention to the emergence of new risks of exclusion. And in order to do this, uh, the paper draws on digital geography literature and research literature on how digital technologies are experienced by people with intellectual disability. Um, so we talk about the interviews we did with people with intellectual disability and service managers, much like the paper that Elan presented. And we will focus on infrastructure digitization in three sets of urban services, payment services, public transport services, and then public library services. And I will fi finish with a discussion of the interplay of individual social and environmental contextual factors that shape the accessibility of digital infrastructure. Mm. Yes. So the development of digital technologies has really been applauded and celebrated for its promises of cities that will be smarter and more sustainable and more democratic and more accessible. But recent scholarship also questions these very hopeful assumptions and suggests that smart city development redistribute and entrench rather than equalize access to opportunities for, um, for participating in urban communities. And our paper contributes to this body of work by analyzing the uneven effects of urban services digitization for people with intellectual disability. Technological innovation is often um, discussed for its promised potential, 
We, we see in the NDIS as well that they have repeatedly emphasized a desire to optimize the opportunities that technological advancement and digital disruption are offering society, putting the people with disability at the forefront of these opportunities. Also, also they say they wish to do. However, this paper I'm presenting today will show that successful engagement with digital service systems requires a multifaceted alignment of circumstances, and that includes disability supports, the availability of digital technology training, and the availability of personal devices, and that these requirements create exclusions and uneven opportunities for people with intellectual disability. So this paper contributes to work in urban geography and we pull on three intertwined threads in this paper um, of research on how technologies are changing cities. The first one, we build on work that sees digital technology as woven into urban fabrics. While digital inequality research has really long focused on access to computers and internet connections, we follow observations in urban geography that it no longer makes sense to think of the internet as something that you access via a computer when the entire city itself is being reconstructed as a digital platform and a node in networked information communication technologies. Second, we build on geographical work on digital skill Researchers in this field highlight that skills are not held by an individual, but come forth out of a commingling of humans and technologies. They also stress that skills emerge across bodies and environments through repetitive practices. And so authors such, such as um, Lizzie Richardson and David Bissell point to um, the example, for example, of a proficient car driver who all of a sudden has a very interrupted performance when they are put in an unfamiliar car. And they use that example to illustrate that skills are acquired and held in place by repetition of practices in a stable and familiar environment. Third, we draw on the concept of splintered urbanism. And this concept points to processes of privatization that have fragmented service systems into what Graham and Marvin coined splintered urbanism. So systems are now digitizing and creating landscapes that are harder to navigate because service users need, need diverse and constantly changing skills to engage with many different online portals and digital interfaces. And this creates new risks of exclusion. More recently, Mark Horry and Marvin have set out processes of service reintegration, and they have shown that these processes can create more accessible service delivery, but that it often does this in uneven ways. So the benefits of service reintegration can benefit, sometimes benefit only premium paying customers. Um, Research on digital inequality has typically a very strong focus on income, age, gender, and race, and tends to overlook disability. Working with people with intellectual disability on this pro project has been very revealing for thinking about digital inequality um, because, because the group found that it's very challenging to learn to navigate new technologies while they also have low average incomes and it made it harder sometimes for them to work around barriers. A small, a small literature has demonstrated that people with intellectual disability are subject to various forms of digital exclusion, ranging from access to well-functioning devices, exclusion because of lack of motor or literacy skills, or lack of support to develop these skills. Many different circumstances interact um, to create exclusions or limited access. And we therefore follow LSS's work on sensor, sensory disability that challenges the idea that access is a possession or that it can be had, proposing instead that access is a phenomenon in progress, that it is relational and unstable, and that 
it can create benefits, but also launch the individuals into larger social systems that may be empowering, exploitative, or both. So I will not repeat too much of what Elan said here, but so the larger project that this paper comes from looks at four service domains, housing, health, community services, and transport in four cities. But this paper is informed by the Melbourne case study and focuses on digital systems as an infrastructure that increasingly run across and underpins all these different urban service domains. We interviewed people between October 2018 and October 2019. And, um, and we pulled, um, we, we interviewed 10 people with intellectual disability and 15 mainstream service managers and staff. We also interviewed two managers of disability support organizations and two disability rights advocates. Um, we, um, we, we took, we, we, we identified people's challenges around digital access in one of the team meetings and then, um, and then identified the service managers that we already, people that had already talked about digital access and then approached additional service managers, for example, in libraries who organize digital skills training to complement um, the work that we were already doing in the core of the project. Um, so some participants with intellectual disability presented also with physical or sensory disability. Um, the project had a reference group consisting of four people with intellectual disability. And one of the meetings with that group was especially dedicated to this issue and we discussed the research advisors' personal accounts of navigating services using digital technologies. And that discussion was incredibly important for creating some of the insights that are presented in this paper. So first I'm going to talk about electronic payment systems. Uh, online and electronic payment options are very common and they are increasingly taken for granted. Um, but they run all through contemporary cities. Many electronic payment systems, uh, such as FPOS machines, websites, and online banking applications can be very complex for people with intellectual disability. Research participants said that people with intellectual disability often do not have a credit card, and that staff or family do not always grant them full-time access to their funds due to perceived risks. Uh, research participants with intellectual disability who had a debit card pointed out that payment can sometimes be challenging. The small screens and keys on machines uh, can be hard to operate for them. And people who find it difficult to remember numbers also reported uh, challenges around that. Participants said that they felt rushed by counter staff and by other customers who, who were queuing behind them. One participant mentioned people around her questioning whether she had remembered her PIN correctly. And she explained that the impatience made her feel very self-conscious and that that made it harder for her to complete the payment. The account demonstrates that the exclusionary effect of digital technology is not simply about interface design or the skill sets of people with intellectual disability, but a complex interaction between a person's impairment, their skills, and the reaction of the people around them. So access, digital access is at once a technical, an emotional, and a relational process. Research participants with intellectual disability mentioned that contactless payment, which does not require entering a card, makes it easier for them. And, and thanks to contactless payment technology, some people, reported that they no longer needed to carry any cash with them and that that made them feel safer. So one of the advisors said that if anyone robbed me now, they would be very disappointed because he doesn't care any carry any money. At the same time, the technology comes with new challenges and risks. For example, the same research advisor mentioned that when he spends a high amount using contactless payment, sometimes the bank will send him a text message 
asking to verify that it was indeed him making the payment. And he has to do that within a limited time frame. Um, and failure to respond in time can lead to the account being frozen. And he said, this is really difficult because reading sometimes is hard for him. At the same time, research advisors with intellectual disability told us that bank applications on smartphones could make bill, paying bills easier for them. Advisors were particularly supportive of BPAY system, an Australia-wide initiative by a corporate group that allows online payments for a right range of services and businesses. And an advantage of that system is that after the first payment of a bill for a particular service, the biller's information can be saved on a bank app. So future payments become easier. And this example demonstrates that digital payment methods can support service use for people with, for some people with intellectual disability, but it also shows that for others, the accessibility of technology depends on the availability of support to set up payment processes. So together, these accounts confirm a relational emergence of in and exclusion in which opportunities and barriers shift with interactions between technology, skills, and the social dynamics in which all of these relationships are situated. So now I'll speak about um, e-ticketing in public transport. So after years of privatization that has massively splintered Melbourne's public transport system, Public Transport Victoria introduced the card MyKey to reintegrate ticketing for all the services into a single system. MyKey was trialed from 2007 onward and rolled out across the entire network in 2012. And ever since the first trials, disability advocacy groups have raised concerns that the card would create barriers for people with intellectual disability and also other disabilities. These barriers materialized when Mikey was fully rolled out. The difficulty experienced by people with intellectual disability led to the subsequent introduction of the access travel pass for anyone who has a permanent physical disability, cognitive condition or mental illness, who can travel independently and who is unable to consistently physically touch on and off or consistently comprehend the need to touch on and off. However, our data from this project suggests that the benefits of the access pass are not distributed evenly to all people with intellectual disability in Victoria. During interviews with people with intellectual disability, we found that awareness of the existence of the access travel pass and ability to apply depended largely on people's support networks because very few participants had even heard of the provision. With the introduction of electronic gates at key metropolitan transport stations, the digitization of ticketing for all the different transport services in the network have been integrated into the built environment, creating material barriers in those stations. Each major exit at a station such as Southern Cross has a series of turnstile like gates of which one wider easy access gate and that easy access gate will be open and supervised by an authorized officer. People traveling with an access travel pass use these gates. And one of the research advisors with intellectual disability recounted having the gate shut into her shin by an authorized officer because they did not recognize her as having a disability and questioned the legitimacy of her right to use accessibility features. She said that I limp, but that is not good enough for them. This highlights the need for a view on digitization, which considers how technology, staff practices and societal attitudes toward disability interact to create enabling or disabling environments. As discussed by McCrory and Marvin in their paper on reintegration of splintered services, this also illustrates that attempts to reintegrate using digitization can lead to new exclusions that make infrastructure unequally accessible 
So now last I'll talk about um, digital infrastructure in libraries. Public libraries play a crucial role in providing access to digital technologies and services. And library services are simultaneously also undergoing digitization themselves as they are automating their checkouts. Expectations that people own personal devices are increasingly strong and we can interpret this as an example of urban splintering whereby personal investment in technology is required to access digital infrastructures for service delivery. Libraries provide computers for use and tablets for, tablets for loan for people who do not have access to their own devices. This is potentially important for people with intellectual disability who commonly have very modest incomes. However, our research advisors with intellectual disability reported that they prefer not to use public devices for fear of losing personal information and because of difficulty with remembering passwords of accounts. Advisors told us that they only access their service accounts using a personal device because so software such as Northon and Google will generate safe passwords for them and save them on their device. Demands around passwords further splinter services for people with intellectual disability who have difficulty remembering numbers. As some of our participants reported that they no longer use passwords on their personal devices because of the frustration of forgetting them, the research strongly demonstrates that digitization creates new risks and vulnerabilities for this group. Lib so like I said, libraries are also undergoing digitization themselves. And the strongest example that we found of this was in the digitization of checkouts. This effectively also represents an individualization of service use. One library officer said, the problem with the self-service model, the self-assist kiosk, is that most people come in to borrow and they most of the time don't even speak to a staff member, like in the old days when you were dealing face-to-face -face with everyone. So of course, it was much easier if you want to get to know customers or regular customers and be able to cater information specifically for them. So this person reported that staff now have less opportunity to talk to library users, which gives them less opportunity to make them aware of things that are happening in the library or of resources and activities that might be enjoyed by them. This type of individualization through digitization also makes the library's programs and resources less accessible. So the empirical work that we present in this paper adds to work on interactions between digital technologies and inequalities by focusing on the impact of urban digitization on people with intellectual disability. Drawing on conceptualizations of digital technology in cities as integrated rather than as separate to other social and physical spheres of the city our analysis illustrates the, the, the contribution by McCrory and Marvin that reintegration of urban services to overcome splintering of services creates new exclusions. Re digitization reinforces the effects of splintering when access to public services requires private ownership of an electronic device. Affordability barriers therefore limit people on low incomes to access public services. Public urban services such as libraries could potentially help overcome such barriers by offering free public access to digital devices and internet connections. But additional adjustments around passwords will be needed to prevent people with intellectual disability being at greater risk. In the case of the Mikey smart cards, we found that digitized integration that attempts to overcome the complexity of splintered urbanism can itself lead to further complexity and sometimes to exclusion for people with intellectual disability. Digitization is not 
inherently exclusionary for people with intellectual disability, because we also find that easy to use technologies can ease use of certain services. For example, like we saw with the contactless payment systems and password word management software. This highlights ways in which technologies can potentially enable participation, but we want to stress that attention needs to be paid to ways technologies can become exploitative or hazardous. Participants' experiences of interacting with digital interfaces were shaped to a large extent by their interaction with other service providers and users. With the digitization of urban services, the role of these services staff is also changing in ways that can have exclusionary effects for some people with intellectual disability. The sense of being rushed by shop assistants and other customers made it even harder for some participants to complete a digital transaction, such as keying a security code for an online payment. Uh, at the same time, physical environmental features, such as those electronic gates at the train station, strongly shape participants' experiences of engaging with their digital cards, and at times this created exclusionary and physically painful results. Rather than full replacement of human staff with self-service digital technology, the analysis suggests that a more complex set of relationships emerge um, should emerge whereby digitization can remove um, where, whereby when, when digitization is introduced, it should not replace the interaction with the service uh, with this with service staff. So it's important that digital technologies encourage a digital mediation of face-to-face -face interactions and stop the normalized expectation that technological innovation altogether should replace such interactions. Um, that's what I had. I put, I put the citation for the paper that I just presented at the top. And I also took the liberty of collating a list of the peer reviewed um, articles that have come out of the project and uh, a one little side gig as well. Um, so I'll just say if it's okay, Chris, that mm -hmm. the top one here, um, that's called the National Disability Insurance Scheme in an Urban Context, is a really exciting paper that set up the, um, the rationale for the research project. Um, then the one about mobility justice is a paper that might be interesting for people who found this last paper on service digitization interesting because it engages with um, policymakers who think about how transport systems take on processes of digitization and the effects of inclusion on the network. Um, then, then there's a paper especially on how people with intellectual disability interact in neighborhood houses, which I thought maybe Jacinta might find interesting because there's some stuff in there on um, individual support coming into mainstream service settings. And then the last one is the paper that Elan just presented. We've been very productive, haven't we? Um, and still more, more on the way as well. And I'll stop talking now. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thanks very much, Ellen.